Welcome back to another one of our studies in the Great Controversy. We're on lesson number four, and the study for this week's lesson is based on the Great Controversy chapters, the book Great Controversy chapters four to six. As I've explained earlier, although the lessons are Bible-based, we are using Great Controversy, the book Great Controversy, as our commentary for this series. I sure hope that you're reading it. You'll be really blessed as you do. The book the Great Controversy by Ellen White has circulated into the tens of thousands, millions of copies, and scores of people around the world during this period of time are reading the book Great Controversy. In the, today's lesson, titled Standing for Truth, we find the fulfillment of Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. In Acts 5 verse 32, Peter makes this remarkable statement. Um, and uh, let's go back and pick up the uh, Acts 5, verse 28, then I'll go to verse 32. In Acts 5, verse 28, the authorities say to Peter, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you've filled Jerusalem with all your doctrine, and do you intend to bring this man's blood on us? You've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Peter, James, John, the disciples stood for truth, and God blessed that as all Jerusalem was filled with the doctrine. What does Peter say when they threatened him and command him not to teach in the name of Jesus? Peter says, verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They stood fast for the truth of God's word, and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Look, Peter says, him has God, that's Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. We are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those that obey him. So the Holy Spirit empowered the disciples' witness so that thousands, tens of thousands, would be impacted by the gospel. But the Holy Spirit empowered them. The Holy Spirit strengthened them, strengthened each of these apostles, each of these disciples of Christ, so they could face torture, imprisonment, economic challenges, and uh, death itself. And so when we come close to Christ, the Holy Spirit empowers us to stand for the truth of God's word. In the introduction to this lesson on Sabbath afternoon, I tell the story of the wonderful uh, Christian leader, Polycarp, who stood for Christ in Smyrna. That's the modern city of Izmir in Turkey. Smyrna, you remember, is mentioned as the second of the churches of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The word Smyrna means sweet-smelling incense. Once a year, the Roman government required every citizen to burn incense to the gods of Rome. Polycarp was a committed Christian. He felt he certainly couldn't burn incense to those gods. He was brought into the marketplace of Smyrna, the Agora. The proconsul of the city said to Polycarp, Old man, because Polycarp is 86, 87 years old by now, says, old man, just burn incense and walk out of the, here, out of this agora, out of this marketplace and live. Polycarp looks up and he says, 80 and six years have I served him, my master Jesus, and he has done me no wrong. How can I ever betray him now? And Polycarp, to the jeers and cheers and yells of the crowd was burnt at the stake. Polycarp stood firm for truth and his martyrdom impacted others. Now, a period of compromise came into the church from about 321 AD till 500 AD. By this time, 538 AD to be specific, the church entered, had gone through a period of compromise, a period of distortion of the truth of God's word. Here's when images came into the church and replaced worshiping God directly. 
Here's where sun worship came in or Sunday came in rather than worshiping the Creator on the Sabbath. Here's where the church councils took the place of the Word of God and the teachings of man took the place of the cross of Christ. So you have this, this era as the church is becoming, the Roman church is becoming a large bureaucracy and by 538 AD, the Roman church was largely ruling Europe. Um, church and state had united. Now the Bible had predicted this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. You'll find this in uh, Sunday's lesson. I list two texts there, Daniel 7, verse 23 to 25, that talks about the little horn, the papal power reigning for time, times, and half a time, or 1260 years. You find in Revelation 12, verse 6, a very similar expression as to what we have in Daniel. Revelation 12, 6 says, and then the woman. Now, who's the woman, everybody? It's the church, right? We've already identified in previous lessons, the woman is the church, into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. There are more than 20 lines of evidence of the day-year principle in the Old Testament, according to Dr. William Shea, a biblical chronologist. And um, Dr. Shea documents that. Numbers 1434 says, I've appointed you each day for a year. Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6 says, I've appointed you a day for a year. So in Bible prophecy, now not every time a day is mentioned does represent a year, but when you see beasts and when you see symbolic language, one prophetic day equals one literal year. So 1260 days in this prophecy would, would, ind, would represent 1260 years. The woman, the church, flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Now notice, the place is prepared by God. In the wilderness experience of life, in the dark ages, God had men and women who stood faithful to him. God has never been without a witness. He's, the world has never been so dark that there has been no light. God, the light of truth at times flickered dim, but God always has had light in this world. Verse 14 in Revelation 12, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, who's the woman in the church, that she might fly into the wilderness. Did we see the woman flee into the wilderness in verse 6? We did. Same time period. And it says here in verse 14 that where she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Church and state unites. Satan the dragon wants to destroy the church. The serpent wants to deceive it and have it filled with all falsehood and stamp out all truth. But God prepares a place in the wilderness. God nourishes his church. So for every conflict, God is a way prepared. And you know, it's so true in our life. When we go through our wilderness experiences, God is a place prepared for us. When we go through our very difficult times in the wilderness of our life, God nourishes us. God draws us closer to him. God strengthens us. So in Sunday's lesson, here's the main point in Sunday's lesson that if you're a teacher, if you're studying, you want to bring out. God is never caught by surprise by evil. Although the medieval church reigned from 1260 years, from 538 AD to 1798. The church began to reign when the last of the barbarian tribes, the Ostrogoths, were driven out of Rome in 538 AD. It began to reign when Justinian, the pagan Roman emperor, gave to Vigilus II, the Pope of Rome, civil and religious authority. So the church dominates the landscape for 1260 years. Remember, even in the days of Reformation time, the church is dominated in the landscape then. But in 1798, Napoleon sent his general Berthier down to Rome. The Pope was taken captive and the Pope died in captivity. So the church was persecuted during those 1260 years but it was triumphant because the flicker of truth continued to reign. Light will always vanquish the darkness. The Bible says in Jude chapter 3, there's only one chapter, but Jude 3 and 4, the Lord gives this counsel to his people. Compromise would be coming into the church. Error would be 
filling the church. And God gives his people this word. Jude, Jude verse 3 and 4, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus. Here Jude says, contend for the faith which was once earnestly delivered to the saints. Contend for the truths of the word of God. The note under Monday's lesson puts it this way. These faithful believers were urged to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. This admonition went even more to the believers in the Middle Ages. After pagan practices had flooded into the church and human traditions compromised the word of God for many centuries, people such as the Waldensians stood as champions of the truth of Scripture. They believed Christ was their only mediator, the Bible their only source of authority. And then Ellen White makes this comment in the book, Great Controversy, page 61. In every age, in how many ages? How many ages? In every age, there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and men, who held the Bible as the only rule of faith, a rule of life, and hallowed the true Sabbath. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, God gives a remarkable promise. He says to the church at Smyrna, that very church that existed in the days of Polycarp, that very marketplace where Polycarp was martyred, he says, be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, and I will give you a crown of life. These words were written in the days of Smyrna. Now, it's interesting. One of the city's patron guards was Dionysus, the god of festivity and fertility. When the priests of Dionysus died, a crown was placed on their heads and in the funeral, it was, they wore it for the funeral procession. Now John contrasts this temporary crown. They're buried, these priests of Dionysus are buried. Their crowns are buried with them and the crowns fade away. They're tarnished and covered under the earth. But uh, John says, be faithful unto death and you will receive a crown of life. You'll receive eternal life. So stand firm for God. Don't waver, don't compromise because you'll have a crown that is far better than the crowns of the priests of Dionysus. Take courage and stand. I love what it's put in Tuesday's lesson. We'll look at one of the three texts listed there. We list three, Acts 5, 28 to 32, Acts, Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 12, and Revelation 3, 11. But in Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 12, the Bible talks about the struggle, this struggle that we call the great controversy. Ephesians chapter 6. And there is this struggle that's going on in the universe between Christ and Satan, between truth and error. And uh, Ephesians 6, verse, starting with verse 10, the scripture there, when you look at verses 10 and 11, talks about the need for being faithful to Christ. But you come down to verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, 12, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So the courage to stand means that we stand against the principalities and powers of evil. It means we do not yield to those powers. When Peter and the disciples said we ought to obey God rather than men, they grasped Paul's admonition to be strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6.10, in the power of his might. They took seriously what it meant in Revelation 3.11, hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Rather than submit to the traditions of the Roman church, these stalwart men and women of faith had the courage to stand and stand for the truth of Scripture. Now, the Waldenses copied scripture. Mothers taught their children the word of God. Mothers encouraged their children to memorize large portions of the word of God. You talk about a group of people that obeyed God rather than men. You talk about a group of people that had the courage to stand the title of our lesson this day. It were the Waldensians. 
It was the Waldensians. The Waldensians stood. Many of them at times were martyred, persecuted, but they preserved the word of God. They copied and copied and copied the scriptures. Some of these young, bright, intelligent Waldensians youth hid the scriptures in their long flowing, flowing robes. Their mothers had made secret pockets in the robes. And as they went down, they looked for some seeker that would be guided by the Holy Spirit. Look at the way Ellen White puts it here in the book, Great Controversy, page 61. It says there, they believed Christ was their only mediator and their sole source of authority. And then next sentence, in every age, there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator. We were sharing that. But jump over to Tuesday's lesson. These Waldensians had the Bible tucked away, had Bible passages hidden in the pockets of their long flowing robes. And Ellen White, uh, in the book Great Controversy, says this, guided by the Holy Spirit at the right moment, when they would sense a receptivity, they would share scriptures with others, and many would read those scriptures, and the light of truth would be burning in the dark ages, and the authorities would say, where is that coming from? And they would not be able to discover it. Why? Because the Waldenses had the courage to stand. Truth would triumph. Wednesday's lesson I've entitled The Morning Star of the Reformation. It's the story of John Wycliffe, who took the Bible in his hands and believed it like it read. He believed that every person should have opportunity to understand the Bible in their own language. Uh, in Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11, Wycliffe grasped passages like this. He loved the book of Psalms. Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. You can see the early reformers loved Psalms. Luther, for example, Martin Luther loved the book of Psalms. They committed large numbers of the Psalms, members, large verse chapters of the Psalms to their memories. The Waldensian children would memorize large sections of the Psalms. Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Look, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect, and what does it do? Converts the soul. What is the testimony of the Lord? It's sure, certain. What does it do? Makes wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are what? They're right, and what do they do? Rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is what? Pure. And what does it do? It enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. And what does it do? It endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are what? True. And what do they do? They are righteous altogether. The reformers read these passages and their hearts were thrilled as they'd read a passage like Psalm 119, verse 140. As the, as the reformers read these passages, their hearts thrilled. They found a new joy and peace in their life. Psalm 119, verse 140. Your word is very sure. Your servant loves it. The Waldenses love the word of God. Huss and Jerome loved the word of God. John Wycliffe loved the word of God. The Martin Luther loved the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 162. Psalm 119, verse 162. The scripture says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. For them, there was great treasure in the word of God. And you remember what it says in Jeremiah 15, verse 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. And they were what? Joy and rejoicing to my heart. Each of the reformers, looking at the note under Wednesday's lesson, each of the reformers rejoiced in God's word. They delighted in doing God's will. They loved his law. One of the most significant foundational truths of the Reformation was the joy that the studying the scriptures brought. Bible study was not a laborious task. It was not a legalistic exercise. It was not a rigid requirement, but a delight. As they studied the scriptures, they were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Great Controversy, page 94. The character of Wycliffe is a testimony to the educating, 
transforming power of the Holy Scriptures. It was the Bible that made him what he was. The effort to grasp the great truths of Revelation imparts freshness and vigor to all the faculties. It expands the mind. Now, what does studying the Bible do? It gives a freshness and a vigor. What's vigor? A life to all our faculties. It, 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 it expands the mind. When you study the Bible, it expands your mind. It sharpens the perception. It ripens the judgment. The study of the Bible will ennoble every thought, feeling, and aspiration as no other study can. It gives stability of purpose, patience, courage, and fortitude. It refines the character and sanctifies the soul. An earnest, reverent study of the scriptures, bringing the mind of the student in direct contact with the infinite mind would give the world, men and women, of stronger and more active intellect as well as of nobler principle than has ever been resulted from the ablest training of human philosophy affords. Wow. The reformers, the Waldensians and Huss and Jerome and Tyndall and Wycliffe and Luther, Calvin, as they emphasized Bible study, it elevated all society. Men and women had a sharper intellect, a, a broader thinking process and expanded mental faculties. Now, Paul gave this counsel to Timothy and certainly it was followed by the reformers and the Waldensians. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. As the faithful men and women of, the old, of Scripture and faithful men and women of the New Testament, faithful men and women of the Church of the Dark Ages, as they studied the Word of God, they followed this counsel, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. They, were, they endured hardship as good soldiers of Christ. But as Paul said, they taught what they understood they taught what they learned about the Bible. They taught what God was teaching them through his Holy Spirit and Scripture. They taught that to others. We are constantly cheered by hope. How did the believers in the Middle Ages experience the reality of the great controversy? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. So we're now in a period called the Middle or Dark Ages. The church is being persecuted, the Christian church, the believers, it would be more accurate to say, were being persecuted by the popular church. We're looking at Thursday's lesson, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Christ, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil and release those who fear of death were all the lifetime subject to bondage. How did these believers experience the reality of the great controversy? How do you deal with it when you are facing death? How, are you to, how do you deal with it when you know that your head is on the axeman's block? How do you deal with it when you know you're going to be burned at the stake? How do you deal with the, the reality that you have just a few days to live? He says, inasmuch then children have partaken flesh and blood, he himself, Christ, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him, that had power of death, that's the devil, and to release those who through fear of death were all the lifetime subject to bondage. If the reformers lived in constant fear, they would be subject to bondage, but they recognized that the Christ that died did not stay on the cross. The Christ whose broken, blue, bloody, bruised body was placed in that tomb that day did not stay in the tomb. The stone was rolled away. Thunder crashed, lightning flashed. And an angel of heaven descended and said, Son, your father calls thee. And Jesus came forth out of that grave in the brightness and glory of the Father 
and the soldiers fell back as dead men. Christ is alive. Christ is alive. Christ is alive. And because he is alive, you and I need not fear death. What was it that cheered the faithful Waldensians during the horrible persecutions they faced? Thursday's lesson, first paragraph. What gave Huss and Jerome, Tyndall and Latimer, and the martyrs of the Middle Ages? Courage to face the flames and the sword. Faith in the promises of God. They believed Christ's promise, because I live, you'll live also, John 14, verse 19. They found his strength sufficient for life's trials. They even found joy through fellowship with Christ and his sufferings, and their faithfulness was a powerful witness to the world. See, the reformers looked beyond what was to what will be. They looked beyond today till tomorrow. They looked beyond earth to heaven. They looked for a glorious event called the second coming of Christ. And they believed that one day Jesus would come and that if they die before his coming, he would open their graves. Just like the angel called Jesus come forth and the stone was rolled away, so the angel will call John come forth, Mary come forth, Harry come forth, Miriam come forth. Once again, the graves would open. What, once again, believers would come forth with glorious immortal bodies. Once again, at the coming of Christ, the righteous living and the righteous dead in their immortal bodies would ascend to heaven. There is nothing to fear on earth if your heart and mind is anchored in heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the history of the great controversy and we see reformers that were totally dedicated to you, sold out for you. They stood for you with courage and faith and hope. Help us, Lord, to be able to stand for you, with you, for you, throughout all eternity. We are so thankful that the courage to stand comes from Christ. And so we give our lives to you just now. Help us to be faithful always in Christ's name. Amen.